Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Executive Editor for Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining this month's installment of the Dataversity webinar series, Big Challenges in Data Modeling, moderated by Karen Lopez. Today, Karen will be discussing supertyping and subtyping with guest speaker, Dr. Gordon Everest. A couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them by the Q&A section, or if you like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag BCDmodeling, Big Challenges in Data Modeling. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to this recorded session and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Let me introduce today's guest speaker, Dr. Gordon Everest. Dr. Everest is a professor emeritus at MIS and DB, of MIS and DBMS in the Carlson School of Management at the University of Minnesota. With early retirement, he continues to teach as an adjunct. Besides teaching about databases, he has helped many organizations and government agencies design their databases. His approach transfers expertise to professional data architects with those organizations by having them participate in and observe the conduct of database design project meetings with the subject matter experts. He's a frequent speaker and at, prof at professional organizations such as DEMA. If you already know our esteemed moderator, Karen Lopez. Karen is a senior project manager and architect at Info Advisors. She has 20 plus years of experience in project and data management on large multi-project programs. Karen specializes in the practical application of data management principles. She is a Microsoft SQL Server MVP specializing in data modeling and database design. She's an advisor to the DEMA International Board and a member of the advisory board of Zachman International. And with that, I will turn it over to Karen to get us started. Hello. And welcome. Hi, thanks. Hi, Gore. How are you doing today? Hi, Karen. Just great. <laughs> yeah, so we're just going to try something different. We're going to use our webcams just at the beginning, mostly just say hi, everyone, and make it more less about just looking at a screen. Um, I wanted to thank Shannon, as usual. You do a wonderful job getting us all set up for these things. We couldn't do it without you, nor without Dataversity and all the people behind that that make this happen. I see and you've got down there the uh, Enterprise Dataversity um, training uh, event listed down there where I'm going to be teaching a couple of um, half-day courses, and that's how the whole event works. So it's not just a conference. It's a series of in-depth tutorials about uh, uh, some great modeling and data management topics, and I'll be looking forward to that coming up, so I recommend it. Uh, one of the reasons why I wanted this topic this month is we've done a lot in the last few months about the process of modeling, of challenges with working with different types of team members and all of those things. But I, I really want to get now back deep into actual data modeling issues. And, and the first person I thought of was Gord, not just because he's a fellow Canadianish person, but <laughs> at one point in time, <laughs> just like all of us should be uh, somewhat, we need more Canada in the world. Um, yeah. but, <laughs> but, you know, he's done a, a series of these presentations, sometimes as a double session at the EDW conference. It's ending room only when he gives it. Um, he does a good balance of theory as, as well as practicality. And today uh, I've asked him to, to share some of his slides from these presentations. There's a whole bunch to go through. We're definitely going to try to take those questions. I'll be looking at Twitter and in the chat. But if you really have a, a burning question or an interesting question, or you just want to say something, please put it in the Q&A part of the panel that you have for, for the uh, webinar platform so that we see it. Uh, the thing is, is that yes, the slides will be made available. Yes, there will be a recording. And if you please use that BCD modeling hashtag when you tweet it. I'm going to turn off my webcam now so that I, I can focus on doing all of those things. Gordon, it's up to you what you do. Um, but I think I'm going to go ahead and give you present mode so that you go ahead and start with your slides. Um, there's the opening slide. Uh, just <laughs> hey, it looks just like your picture. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. At least I've got a suit on there. <laughs> uh, uh, just, just for interest, you were saying how long you've been involved in data processing. I programmed my first computer in 1960, 
and we had uh, an, an LGP-30 made by Bendix. It was by absolute code, no assembler code, no languages. It was great fun coding that machine with ones and zeros all across every line of your coding sheet. Think of debugging that. We've got a long way, come a long way since then. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to uh, assume that you've got, that these have a, a decent amount of uh, knowledge about data modeling. Uh, if you don't know anything about data modeling, you might be lost here. I'm not going to talk about tools. I will spend a, a little bit on notations that you might see in some of the tools. I'm not going to talk about implementation except for my slide where um, I get to the question of how do you reflect this stuff or convert it into tables. Uh, because in, uh, we don't talk about tables when we're talking about uh, subtypes, supertypes. It's something that has to precede that. Okay, so uh, the tools that you do use, oftentimes that will form your opinion about what subtypes and supertypes are all about. I uh, need a fuller understanding, however, to recognize the limitations, especially the constraints, uh, and to properly use the constructs in our own data modeling. So we say, I call this the most valuable construct. You all know that there's entities and there's attributes and there's relationships and there's keys. Uh, beyond those, there's uh, the number of subtypes and supertypes. Uh, oh, I, there. Uh, the fundamental, just, just as background, the fundamental assumption in data modeling is we work with entities or objects. Uh, we'll draw a box in our diagrams, and that box represents an entity type. We'll put a name on it, define structure, but most importantly, that box indicates a population of individual instances of something. Uh, we tend to group into types or into these populations is essentially arbitrary how we do that. That's an imposed view by the designer. The world isn't naturally that way. And the task assumptions that's always made in relational systems is that those populations are strictly disjoint. They're mutually exclusive, non-overlapping. In other words, an individual cannot belong to more than one. You think that they do, but the system is always making the assumption those individuals are distinct. Okay, uh, so is this always true? If we give example of employee, customer, and shareholders, are those three distinct populations? Well, you tell me that a person could be all three of them, right? Are there likely to be three files or tables in your organization for these three? Yes. And the question is now, we have this the impasse, so to speak, um, how do we model these? Well, we're going to talk about now. So, types and supertypes, that allows us to formally represent overlapping populations. That's the key idea between behind subtypes and supertypes. And remember that every individual member of a subtype is it's supertype, all of its supertype populations. I don't plan on spending a lot of time unless somebody asks about multiple supertypes, uh, sometimes called multiple inheritance, um, because most of the tools don't offer that. that. It's, it lends some complexity that uh, is further than we need to go today to a proper understanding. Okay, okay so this example, I'm showing different roles that are played by members of a common population. Uh, the, uh, another approach here is to uh, uh, mod different states of an entity over time. Okay. Those are two common reasons for why we want to use subtypes and supertypes. Um, in, in the bottom, in the different states, it may or may not be that an order can be in multiple states at the same time. Lord, um Yeah. One of the things I was taught a long time ago is that subtyping this way, based on a life cycle of something, and these are sort of dates, but just 
the orders kind of have a life cycle to them as well. Um, I thought that this was not a great way to do subtyping. Um, is why that might be? Well, miss you. Are there extra attributes that you want on any of, of uh, on a on a thing in any of those states? Obviously, you can define a record that's going to include all of the information that you would be using for it in any one of those states. That could be unwieldy. Subtypes, subtypes would be the way of dealing with that. Okay. I hit on something a little bit later, too, and I think most of the objections to this and most of the objections that people get on supertyping and subtyping is really focused on the physical implementation of them. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll leave that till the end, but I just wanted to bring that up is as I'd love for the audience to really think about you know, the rules that they've been taught. Think about why they might have been taught that, and I think a lot of the rules that I hear people either their consultants telling people or what I see in books or something really about physical implementation issues with subtypes and not so much about logical modeling of them. Yeah, and you're not talking about implementation here. The exactly. last slide that I'm going to use, we'll be talking about how do you form, how do you build the tables, and yeah. beginning to get at the question of physical implementation. Let me say the most important thing that you must keep in mind always when thinking about subtypes, supertypes, is that you're always talking about populations. You're looking at individuals that are in different populations. So it all has to come back to the question of populations. Okay? Yep. Uh, so there, there's really two things that are valuable in uh, the use of subtypes, supertypes. Number one is we formally represent overlapping populations, and number two is we can defer the question of where to build the tables. And it's, if we start thinking about tables too soon, we're going to get into trouble. Um, okay, so it's common to think about a subtype supertype as a relationship. It's tempting to call it that, uh, but it's not a relationship. Uh, a relationship is something that's between members of one population with members of another population, and those could be the same population in a recursive relationship or reflexive relationship. Um, it's always between different instances. So uh, we say that uh, a, a type is in, in a subtype. You remember the supertype. You're saying the the subtype is a. So we an employee is a person. Okay. Um, in in fact, if you think of it as a relationship, you're thinking of, of the one thing in the subtype is equal to the one thing, same thing in the supertype. Well, does it make sense to think about modeling? The thing that a thing is always related to itself? Uh, I think so. Okay. So, how do we think about uh, using subtypes and supertypes? There are basically two ways um, recognizing when this can be useful. And remember that we're always still thinking about entity populations. Generalization says if I get two Options and I observe from some commonalities, then that's justification for introducing a supertype. That would be a common uh, thing that relates the members of the different subtypes. Uh, that would be considered kind of a bottom up view. Specialization is where I'm looking at a population and saying, hey, there's a subset of the members of that population to treat differently or or especially. Uh, they apply a constraint or have a different attributes be mandatory or have additional relationships, whatever. Okay? Specialization, specialization. Some people call the generalization abstraction, and let me just call it out. Abstraction, in my way of thinking, is... Different abstraction, if you look at the Webster's Dictionary, it says it's hiding things uh, from view. Uh, 
we're talking about hiding when we talk about generalization. We're talking about finding commonalities. Abstraction is actually an issue of presentation, not an issue of modeling, whereas generalization is an issue of modeling. And if you want to call generalization abstraction, um, then I'll call general. Well, anyway, let's. <laughs> I'll go this one. Uh, two rules, and two things must always be true. Every subtype is must be a subset potentially of the supertype population. If it was not a subset, you wouldn't call out the subtype. Okay. And every subtype must inherit all of the roles of the supertype. And have additional roles. So in this example, we say a person has a name and a birth date, and that was the basis on which you would come up and say uh, there's a commonality across employees and shareholders, etc. A person, uh, a name and a birth date, and an employee is a person, and we add the positions, uh, the uh, attribute position and salary, and then we can say a boss is a special case or a subset of employees. Uh, and they would have attributes such as organization, unit, and budget. Organization. So we see that we can begin to build, uh, you might think of it as a hierarchy, but it's not a hierarchy. It, it can be broader than that. Both yeah. so conditions are true. We're getting some questions and comments about where the sort of data modeling pattern of party and party role fit here. Um, so we're getting some comments about aren't really subtypes of roles and not really subtypes of people. Oh. Um, first of all, <clears throat> think about the population. The population of party is going to be uh, lots of different things, and you're going to want to establish uh, one of the attributes of the person is going to be a role. And I can establish subtypes and uh, subtypes of party on the basis of the role or roles that they play. And that would be perfectly consistent with what we're trying to do here. Right. So you talk about discriminators, as I call them, um, in, in a couple slides. Um, yep. I wonder if the reason a lot of us go to the party role thing is also influenced by the fact that, um, and you might be talking about this later about tools, is that most data modeling tools only allow a, a type to be uh, a sub, sub entity to be a subtype of only one super type at the same time, and that um, role allows someone to be both an employee, a customer, and a shareholder at the time. And so a married person, an unmarried person, you know, different reasons. Like persons definitely are a great candidate for subtyping things because we as society have all kinds of data that distincts that we keep about um, types of people, right? Yep, yep. Uh, uh, let me perhaps bring up the question of a shareholder. Uh, could an organization be a shareholder as well as a person? And the answer would be yes. So yeah. uh, uh, not have shareholder as, as a subtype of both person and organization unit because remember the rule is every subtype, every member of the subtype must be a member of all of its supertypes. Okay. All of them, right? Yeah, and that's mutually must, must be. Uh, be going to inherit all of those characteristics. Uh, yeah. uh, a subtype is a subset of each supertype population. Must be. That's yeah. that's definition of subtype supertypes. Uh, we answered the question. Yeah, I just maybe as you go through the rest slides, you can you'll be answering that question. I think of okay, why you see these the subtypes. Get toward the end, and then we'll see uh, if if people still don't have a, a, an understanding of that. Okay, so we as we move up this hierarchy, let's call it a hierarchy. Um, we have, to have more interest instances or larger populations. As we move down, we have more attributes. That's just a, a handy visual to recognize what's going on here. Okay, um, so we diagram this. They're basically two ways 
Uh, one way is uh, the nested uh, using an Euler diagram. This is intuitively very, uh, very good because we can see now an employee is a person. Um, boss is an employee. We've added shareholder in here. It's clean, it's compact, it's visually intuitive. However, it is not very good in representing complex cases, particularly when we get to, uh, to represent constraints on these relationships. Uh, on these uh, subtype supertypes. Okay, it's one way. The more common way is what I call the separated one. Um, we have separate boxes for the person, for the subtypes and the supertypes, and then we have a heavy arrow. You can put whatever you want, but it, it's not a relationship. It's a heavy arrow that indicates that MP is a subset or a subtype of person. It's really less sort of, it's more cluttered in the diagrams, um, but it makes it a lot easier, as we'll see, to represent constraints. On, oh, I'm just showing you how uh, it's in extended R or in IE or IDEF1X typically. Uh, we'll see a bit more about that. So these are the two ways, and I'm going to focus on the separated. Okay, so let's talk about constraints. Uh, on these um, subtype supertypes. First of all, uh, a constraint should truly be a constraint. In other words, if you don't have the constraint, you have the more general case. And the general case here is um, that we can have overlapping populations, and every member of the supertype does not need to be in some of its subtypes. Okay. So the constraint on the first one, if it's not Overlapping, then we have to declare an exclusion constraint across two sub more sub subtypes. Um, you could think of that as the uh, at most one. Uh, you can, in at most one of your subtypes. The is that is that what we sometimes call mutually exclusivity? Yep. Yep. Subtyping? The subtypes so, are mutually so, exclusive. Right. So That's, and and in some of the tools, there's. There's some ways that that's expressed, and sometimes it's more of a property of the subtyping, you know, that in your tool, and then other notations use the arc notation. Um, do you have a preference there? No. Uh, <laughs> no. no. I'm asking. Which, it's okay that you don't have one. Which communicates better, um, and I guess I'm not going to make a judgment about that. Okay. All right, so I think a lot of people have been asking for this arc notation in tools because it's actually on the diagram, whereas when it's a property of of a subtyping, then it's really sort of hidden in the metadata and no visual way. In, in And this is tied to one, uh, F1X. F1X, which we're going to talk a little bit more about that too, doesn't have arc notation and tool vendors because they want to be IDEF 1X compliance for government work um, do that and I think that's been sort of a tough position for the vendor product managers because everybody's asking for it but not part of that standard. Okay, I have to ask what you mean by property. Uh, um, so uh, I'm using that as a generic term. So in modeling tools, you know, you right click on something and then you choose a property of it. So in, in IDF1X one, one notation, usually that mutual exclusivity, depending uh, sorry, depending on which notation you're using in your tool, so it's just a property of the subtype. Sometimes it shows as um, in the subtype uh, um, on your diagram, and sometimes it's just something you can report on. Well, if you're using a property and applying it only to one subtype, that doesn't make any sense because we're talking about exclusion across two or more subtypes. So property one oh. subtype, what we have to say is that a particular subtype population is mutually exclusive with respect to another subtype population. I, the, the super And the super type population cannot be in both. That's what I'm trying to say with this constraint. Yes, so that's what I mean. So when I say it's a property of the subtyping, I'm really thinking of the subtyping 
object on your diagram. So again, I'm talking about how tools implement this, not databases yeah. or anything. So it's it's how the features of the tools and how they've interpreted some of the. I think things we're going to keep talking about here is how different tool vendors have implemented subtyping. Sure. How okay. that ends up being a challenge for us. Let me let me clarify this a little bit. You're talking about a property, and it's really not a property of the subtype. It's a property of the supertype. And supertype, you say. Um, yes. Yes. This thing can be an employee and um, an employee and a shareholder at the same time. Yeah. And therefore, it's not exclusive. Mm -hmm. It is a property of the supertype. It's there is using subtyping, so not subtype. Oh, I'm okay. trying to avoid the word relationship, even though all the tools tend to call it a relationship. See how this gets all convoluted? Yeah. Um, it's, it's actually something you right-click on the subtype, so the lines between the supertype and the subtypes, and you put it on that. You put the property there. Uh, well, that doesn't make <laughs> sense if they're doing that, because it has to be with respect to two of the say, supertype lines. Or yeah, and it, it's in the um, – so it, they uh, IDEF1X, you know, of course, does, doesn't do the – it does the separate entities. Um, and so you put all the properties for the subtype on the, the single line, you know how they split it up, the same line, line but underneath, I'll say underneath the super type. So there you put it. It still, uh, ends, up being, ends up being a constraint on all of the higher set of entities. Yeah. Okay. Um, Got it. And, and that in itself is part of the problem, is that yep. it's an all or nothing deal. Uh, and that's an unnecessary yes. restriction in the notion of self subtypes and supertypes. And that show us. Slide, I think it's yeah. going to make that clear. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we declare constraints on the more restrictive cases. Um, so you say that uh, uh, first case, you must be in at most one. In the second, uh, the constraint on the second one is you must be in at least one. And what we're saying about the members of the supertype population. Um, okay. So, uh, basically, those those two, uh, there is really a third case, but I'm not going to get into it. Um, so, the exclusion, if you don't say anything, we're assuming that you can be in a number of the subtypes. If you want exclusion across them, then you declare the exclusive uh, constraint. In this example, I've got man, woman, child as being subtypes. I'm saying that uh, if we draw that dotted line across those three arcs, that says that can't be a man or a, and a woman and a child at the same time. You can only be at most one of those. And the other constraint with the dot in the circle that's the uh, totality constraint. It's sometimes called a covering or dependency, mandatory, whatever you call it. Uh, that says that every member of the supertype must be in at least one of the man, woman, child. Uh, okay, so here's another example. And this is a very real example, and it's where we're showing that it's not the same across all the subtypes. In case we're saying that uh, this this is animals is the supertype. A subtype is uh, the oviparous mammal, bird, and fish. And we an animal cannot be both a mammal and a fish at the same time. <laughs> okay. So put the X between those two, and notice that the X only involves two of the subtypes. Say you can't be both a mammal and oviparous, and so we put an exclusion constraint between those two. We know that B is a subtype of O. In other words, birds are a subtype of oviparous. Oviparous is egg-laying, I believe. I'm biased. 
Um, the, the point to be made here is the declaration of subtype uh, contains text across only some of the subtypes. doesn't have to be an all or nothing thing. That's a limitation of your tool if indeed that's the way it's done in the tool. And in the EER notation, that's the only way it can be. For all, for all of them, it's that way. Help. Some notations. Yeah. Um, are the two, the, the exclusive or overlapping, and then the, the total and the partial? And what it's done, uh, how it's note, noted in these... Uh, these five. Um, the two that get it right are uh, object role modeling and <laughs> extent DR doing due to uh, uh, Toby Tori. Um, so a little bit what extended ER is, because I think most of us aren't familiar with it. What oh, really? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, if you look at Tori's books, and he's gone through several editions. This is Toby Tori at the University of Michigan. Um, introduced the notion of an extended ER, and it was simply ER extended with types and supertypes. <laughs> it is added to it. Um, you, I guess just have to go on. Uh, sure. Do some search on that. Anyway, um, so you can see with IE, that's the one that's due, uh, information engineering due to Clive Finkelstein. Uh, he doesn't say anything about total versus partial. There's no notation for that. And the t notation for um, uh, overlapping is put an X for exclusive if there are. Uh, notice that it has to cover all of the subtypes because there's no other. Unless you have two of these little half moons uh, underneath the same supertype. I've ever seen that. And that would really get confusing in the in the graphic. Uh, yeah, you can do that. So things I wanted to point out here is that um, a lot of modelers don't understand um, the fact. So most of the modeling tools these days let you uh, choose a notation. So you can choose information engineering or IE notation, yep. IF1X. And IF1X is, you know, what most of the tools support. Um, but to think of it as this just changes the cardinality indicators on the end of relationships from circle and dots to crow's feet and uh, box. And that, uh, that you have a regular relationship, right? A relationship. Yeah. And, and make some other sort of, you know, aesthetic changes, right? They think of it just as choosing a different notation. Uh, but one of the things that happens under the covers in tools is that when you switch your notations or choose your notations in the model, if you choose IE notation, they go to set the, the properties of a subtyping. You only get those two choices of mutually exclusive or non-mutually exclusive. And then if you were to change it to IDEF1X, you'd only get, um, I think, it covering and um, non-covering or something like that. And so it's common that I work with models that have been worked with for a long time where, where teams tend to use uh, IE notation for the logical model and F1X for the physical, and they're not, they don't even realize that they've got this metadata part of their model. And yeah. The data is still there in your model, but you're only allowed to see and report on and play with one set of these um, constraints. Yeah. Uh, so this this chart here uh, should make it clear. Uh, IE that have at least original IE didn't have any representation of partial versus total. Mm -hmm. And then want to convert to IDF one X. You don't know whether to have the double line under the the, the circle or not because that information. On the other hand, and the and for the other side. Uh, IE does distinguish between overlapping and disjoint. In an IDEF 1X, you only have the disjoint case. You cannot define uh, overlapping populations. A lot of people will take that and say, oh, you can define overlapping populations in subtypes. Well, that's not true. 
That's a good point too, because they've only you know. So I I tend to to enjoy working with the IE notation more, um, maybe because um, I find it easier to talk to business people. I seem to understand the curse feet. You know, I'm just choosing it mostly for that cardinality expression, and that's just a personal preference of mine. It's not a best practice or a standard. Um, I find I find that um, when I start talking about these different sort of constraint properties of subtyping, people are only familiar with one set, and they don't understand that in order to get all of what they've set out of their model out of the tools, sometimes they have to switch notations, then do a report, then switch notations and do a report. Somebody's writing a tool, they need (laughs) to look at this and provide both options for these characteristics. Yeah, in fairness, and for the vendors, they get measured on their compliance to the external standards, especially IDEF-1X. And yes. like any tool under, you don't be out of compliance with it. The IDEF-1X standard doesn't have these. So want to support it. But they hide it. Don't. It's sorted. It's still in your metadata. You just can't yeah. see it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I understand the dilemma. Um, maybe what they need to do is to get on their standards committee and extend and 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 do the standard right. Yeah, I've been there. I've been on several standards committees over the years, and uh, we, you have a good understanding first before you get into the standard. We've got standards that uh, that are weak, uh, do all the cases, etc., and we build our tools to conform to that, and, and we have the kind of confusion that we're talking about here. What I want the, the listeners to get here is we have these two characteristics and we have constraints to define on them. Notice that object role modeling has the correct default, the le- less restrictive case um, as, as the default, so it doesn't require any special notation. Notice that EER, extended ER, um, there's basically a three uh, a three a double logic, three value logic, um, because they have a D or an O, uh, what do you do in the notation if you don't know? Well, question. Yeah. Can you explain ORM a little bit? I know uh, you have whole presentations on that as well, but I'm sure, uh, I think I've shared with you in the past that I learned data modeling using NEOM. Uh, I experienced so quite a few decades ago. But maybe you can explain what ORM is, what object role modeling is. Well, I'd say that uh, NIAM was the, was what Sheer mm-hmm. Nyson came along with um, back in the uh, 70s. Um, I actually taught a course with him over in Europe uh, back then. Um, and he went to Australia and met Terry Halpin, and together they published a book, Apprentice Hall, 1989, where they changed the name to object role modeling because they had extended it from just binary relationships to entry relationships. What was the big difference? So um, you'd say that object role modeling is the is the um, the fun to to NIAM. The thing that's really different about object role modeling is that there is no notion of an attribute. You don't think about an entity building a table for an entity and sticking in attributes. The problem with that is that we often do the incorrectly. Solution to find the mistakes that we made is to apply the rules of normalization. And the solution is always, in, if you violate a normalization rule, the you always have to do is to decompose the record. In other words, you put something there that didn't belong. Uh, in object modeling, we do things in tables, at least at the outset. We just define objects and relationships. That's what's called OM, object relationship modeling. You could think of it. Uh, so we define objects, we define relationships, and then we that an object had, excuse me, an attribute is an object that plays a special role in a relationship with another object. So norms in the definition of an attribute. 
objects and relationships before you can ever talk about attributes. So why don't we just talk about objects and relationships and forget about the word attributes and forget about tables. That's what object role modeling does. And, it, and, and consequently, we never have to worry about normalization. Excellent. So, that's good, because I, I refer to it as fact-based, not tables. It is. It's fact-based. That's a fact. A fact is yeah. a verb with one or more objects. You could say a, a person smiles. be a unary fact. It's got one object and one relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, relationships always expresses a verb, an object expresses nouns. And if you fat rule, then you can always make sentences out of it. What Ross calls bish. <laughs> that sounds language. like a made-up word. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you can continue on now. Okay, see this uh, uh, for the models. I find it interesting that UML, which is often touted as the ultimate modeling scheme, like it doesn't even have any notation for subtypes, supertypes. Yes, it in English labels. Okay, so um, the next thing we talk about is. is and does a member of the supertype population belong into in a subtype population? And um, when we define the rules for that, we we say we have well-defined subtypes. Uh, it's always the definition of membership in a subtype population is always based upon the attribute or attributes in the supertype. Um, uh, it's the characteristics of the relationship between the object and the attribute is to determine uh, what the constraints are that would be on the on the subtypes. So in this example, I say a patient um, patient has uh, a, a or a sex associated with it, um, and the between patient and sex is every patient must have uh, a sex recorded, and there could be uh, at most one is recorded for each patient. You can't be both male and female at the same time, and as there could be multiple patients that have the same sex. Okay, I understand the many to one and the dependency in that relationship. Okay, so how does this then reflect in membership? Of the um, of the subtypes. Um, okay. Whoops. Okay. Not on patient must be in must have um, a, be of a particular sex uh, reflected in this mandatory relationship. Um, you can my pointer. She's the point, pointer up um, okay. next okay, to where so the slide can, numbers are? Yep, yep. If you do that, uh, this one right here? No, that's yeah, the, you can get an arrow, and you can also do hiding, do the pen, depending on what you want to do. Okay. Can you see that? No, are you seeing something? <laughs> Well, I've, I've got an arrow now. All it all it does is change the nature of my. Uh, anyway, let's not worry about that. Okay. Um, so uh, that aspect, the dependency, uh, uh, the dependency optionality characteristic of a relationship is what is going to determine membership in the subtype. So, if I say a patient must uh, be of a of a particular sex, then I'm going to say here, put the totality constraint and say a patient must be. Either uh, m must be in one or more of the subtypes. Okay, what that constraint says, and it's a direct consequence of the nature of the relationship. Okay, so in the next one, uh, we the exclusivity. Come on, huh? That's interesting. Oh, there it goes. Okay, so the fact that a patient could uh, has at most one 
uh, uh, sexes it in the exclusive characteristic that I'll place between male and female. And that is you can be in at most one of those. So we've got at least in the most one. This is perhaps an obvious case, but that's how the characteristics on the relationship are reflected in membership in the subtype. Um, And when we can define uh, the rule for membership, and you think of that as a constraint on membership, um, we have what we call an intentional set. The subset is an intentional set. Sometimes I don't know uh, what that is, what the rule is, in which case uh, we would call this an extensional set, and it is that you're a member of the subtype because somebody put you there not by any rule. Uh, and, and it'd be possible always to, because most systems, if they're going to have uh, defined, sub, uh, defined subtypes, are going to um, want a rule. And you can always have a rule that says, I'll conjure up an attribute that says which subtype or subtypes you're in. And if you can be in multiple, then it'll be a many relationship to that dummy attribute. So I come up with definitions for the rules of membership. The rule of membership can be based upon a Boolean expression across several attributes. Okay? That's an important thing to note. I've got the simplest possible case shown here where you have a single attribute and a rule based upon the characteristics with that single attribute. We have the defining or the distinguishing attribute. Um, Once asked, Gordon, um, sex just an attribute. Why do you subtype people based on their sex? So can you give an oh, answer to that? Okay, um, that's a good question. Uh, what, what what you're really asking about is why am I calling out a subtype for males? Okay, and males. It, in a medical setting here, because there are attributes of males that don't apply to females, and I want to keep track of those. Uh, so, you know, PSA and state of the prostate and things like that. On females, it could be the uterus, how many kids have they had, et cetera. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and and even family. relationships I can think of, right? So maybe, um, you know, a relationship to a gynecologist. Would apply to females. Yep. Exactly. And so I can have a relationship between this population of things called females with anything else I want. Lots of relationships. <clears throat> Notice that in object role modeling, we don't ever talk about attributes because an attribute is something that you have in a relationship with some other type of object. So gynecologist could be their object, and a relationship between gynecologist and females. Everything that you're related to is potentially an attribute of yours, um, even if it's many. And, and it would violate first known reform when you try to put it on a table. Yeah. Okay. Thing, wait, before we move on, because you're, you're doing great here, um, and you're going to get to more in-depth things. Um, this comes to the essence of one of the issues that I found with subtyping, is that I have people who don't subtype at all because it just makes everything so complex. And then I have people who want to over subtype. And I have a slide for this. I'm not going to show it now. Uh, I might show it during the 15 minutes after show thing. But I actually had to work on a project where we had what I called um, professional philosophers. And philosophy is a great fashion. But everything had to be subtyped. Everything. And not just because they had distinctive attributes or relationships, but because it led to clarity. So we ended up with some typings that went 25 levels deep, and it resulted in statements that, so almost everything in our model was a subtype of an entity called agreement. And people were types of agreements, which I said was not very, I could not agree with, but you know, to me, there's this concept of you need to have a reason for subtyping. And clarity is a wonderful reason to do something in a model, 
But in subtyping, if people are just subtyping things because they think about um, inventory really is a type of person, if you think about it, or um, vehicles are really the same things as people because people give their cars names and they have ages. And it kind of, to me, that's sort of a subtyping um, delusion, maybe, where you want to say about that. All right. Um, I, I'm going to Give you a minute. <laughs> I'm going to go to another slide uh, that I've added to the end of this, and okay. then we'll come back here. Okay. It's this one, because uh-huh. this is what gets at it. Uh, first of all, let me say that combination of attributes could serve as the basis for subtypes. And just is that any combination of attributes, because we said that the rule of membership is a big expression across the attributes. Any combination, any any attribute or any combination could be the basis of a subtype. We have thousands, if you like, in that, in that scenario. Uh, so we have to pick those that matter. And that matter are when we have a subset of a super tight population that we want to do something special with, period. That's the only reason for calling out. We are not trying to build a taxonomy, for example. In economy, the rule for a taxonomy is that all of the subtypes must be mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive of the super type population. Well, it's applying both of those constraints, and that just doesn't make any sense. That's a different question. A lot of people uh, think of subtyping and supertyping as building a taxonomy. It is not. Okay. We choose what we want the subtypes to be. It's really an important question. Okay. So let me at what you were saying here. The world we said consists of individual things. Okay. It's the population of all instances, no type. I have tried to, as a designer, I haven't tried to glump them into anything, okay? So you give that as being the N types case, everything is its own type, or the no types case, just individuals. Okay, well, we get very far with that one. So the first thing that we do is we group them, showing that those down on the bottom were individual members in the world of something. And uh, I can group that uh, the first level, and I'll say, okay, I've got products, and I've got organizational units, and I've got people, and I've got invoices, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I will begin to cluster them into groups or populations of things. And, uh, as I, and then I, I, I will find commonalities. I might have at the lower level, I'm, uh, I might have employees and Chillers and customers, and so I say, oh, there's some commonality, so I'm going to form a super type. That, and I can keep going up this hierarchy, and what you suggested, if anything else falls underneath an agreement, was defined as the thing that's at the top, and I can find the thing at the top. The thing up is going to be a single population. It will be one type. Uh, in the OO world, this would be called the root class. Everything is a subtype of the root class. That's what Jeffman called the universal relation. Um, the, relu- the universal relation is a relation that includes everything in my world. <laughs> okay? Now, is that helpful? Yeah. Good theoretical construct to try to understand, but Ray we're going to look at that universal relation and we're going to say, hey, there are subsets of things that I would treat differently. Think about in the universal relation uh, how many attributes you're going to have. You're going to call them for every possible attribute of everything that's in that. Okay. That going to result in a rather sparsely populated table with lots and lots of uh, missing values? Of course. What pick as the identifier? Interesting question because every table has to have an identifier. Yeah, I think that this really explains 
you know, you could build this into your models, right? You could just think and everything. It's just a model person to agreement as his word for thing. I never did understand that, but you pick your battles. Um, yep. We only got five minutes left, Gord. So what part of your original slides, now that I've detoured you, you cover in the next four? <laughs> I have one, one, one slide left, actually. Excellent. Uh, Generalization and specialization across yep. those. Okay, so let me uh, finish that. What the attribute is optional, then you're going to have totality. And what if it's multi-valued? And, uh, okay, then it's not going to be exclusive. Okay, my last slide. How do we, where do we build the tables? I said at the beginning that we build tables uh, at the end of the process, after we got our well-defined subtypes and supertypes. Well, we have three basic choices. We can either build a table based upon members of the population of the supertype, in which case all of the attributes that are on the subtypes have to be absorbed up, flattened up, uh, use a favorite word. Um, and so you see I'm showing here sort of symbolically the supertype has the key uh, K. Uh, D is the distinguishing attribute, and then E sub I are the attributes of the, of the supertype that are common across both A and B. And um, the A dot 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 and the B dot 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 are the attributes of the subtypes. Okay? So that's one way to do it. Another way to do it is to build it on the subtypes only. Uh, you could call flattening down or separation. Uh, absorption separation is what uh, M. Simpson called them in his book. Um, and we've, what you notice is that we are copying down the attributes of the supertype into each of the records for the subtypes. That kind of redundancy can lead to difficulties, of course. So we could do both. We could store the attributes of the supertype. Uh, in one, and then the attributes of the members of the subtypes in their own tables. Now, obviously, in this case, we're going to now define a relationship uh, in the relational model between the subtypes and the supertypes. Okay? So, basic choices. Let me also say that um, you could have any hybrid of these. I call out a subtype whatever, any, any combination. And, um, there are some of, the uh, some of the constraints that are on this. What happens if A and B are exclusive? Type only look like a good choice? Probably not. not. But uh, the subtypes looks like a good choice if they're exclusive. Um, what about if it's exhaustive? What about if it's not exhaustive? If uh, not, he has to be in an A or B. Obviously, subtypes only isn't going to work because I have no table uh, for that aren't in A or B. Uh, a died of uh, oh, I, I could say what happens uh, if we had a large number of attributes for on the supertype and just a couple for each of the subtypes. Probably want to use the supertype only. Uh, what happens if we had have lots of attributes on the subtypes, just a few in the supertype. Well, probably the reverse. Um, the option of both in the partitioning uh, scheme, See, one of the downsides of that is going to be to do any kind of querying, you're going to have to do joining. And this is the most expensive operation that we have in a relational database. Um, so, mm -hmm. and there's also joining in the second case, too. Uh, let me just summarize by saying this. The main problem that we find in using tools is they give all the choices of where to build the tables, okay, including hybrid choices. Um, I could have A and B and decide that I'm only going to build a table for the P's and the A's, and the P's will be absorbed up into the P's, the super type will be called out as a separate table. That would be an option, a 
grassroots kind of option. So number one is not giving choice, all of the choices. Uh, two, not representing the full range of the constraints. Worse, making a constraint you be the default, or even worse, making it the only choice. <laughs> you look at that. That's what some of the tools do. Um, and a thirdly, is not allowing the 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 um, deduction of a rule or a condition for membership in the subtype based upon attribute or attributes of the supertype. I'm just wanting to look at the tools and say, what should we do to improve the tools with respect to subtype supertypes? Those are the three questions that they need to look at. And we're using a tool that has limitations. You understand properly. Uh, three aspects, the constraints and the building of the tables and so on. Excellent. Um, that was all great. And I agree with that. One of my uh, data modeling mantras is your tool influences your data modeling choices much more than you realize. Absolutely. Um, and that's true, not just for data modeling, but it, it, it seems to have formed the body of knowledge of data modeling much more than it should have, I think, over the years. Uh, that's Absolutely true, and that's why people need to approach this whole data question of data modeling, um, uh, you know, sort of correctly, if you like, without the constraints of the tools that they use. Right. So we've come to the end of our hour, which just means we've ended the fourth part of this presentation. I want to thank you, Gord. That was a wonderful overview. I know I've been through a much more extensive version of this. And so I highly recommend anyone who has the opportunity to hear him present this or, or on any of his topics, uh, definitely make a point to attend. Are, do you have any speaking engagements coming up planned on your schedule? We get data modeling zone, um, and I'm okay. going to be speaking at uh, the Seattle chapter um, on November the 14th. Of uh, math. Uh, yeah, I've spoken at many different chapters. Um, and I like yeah. to do that. Interestingly enough, probably the most popular, popularly chosen topic is subtype supertypes. Yes, and yes, I think that's very because popular. the one that's least understood. Yeah, excellent. So, um, I just one other thing, Karen. Um, yeah. At the modeling zone, I'm going to be doing a half day workshop on object modeling. And to okay. help, when we'd consider. Uh, good wife, if you like, of object role modeling. Uh, so be there making two con uh, two uh, sessions. So, so, if you want to find out more about object role modeling, and I'm a real devotee yeah. of that, as yeah. some people will know. Uh, so, thank you very much, Gordon. I have to cut you off here so that we can end yep. the recording, and then we can go on to everything else. So, thank you again. Thank you, attendees, for your great comments and questions. I'm going to try to get to some more of them. Uh, Shannon, over to you. Thank you, and, and thank you, uh, Gordon, for this great, great discussion. Um, I, I think it's, you know, and thanks always to our attendees who are so interactive in everything you do. And hopefully, Gordon, you'll be speaking at Enterprise Data World again on this very topic. We really enjoyed the the presentation last year, and this year it'll be in Washington, D.C. which will be a lot of fun. Uh, and let me turn off the recording for you guys, and then you can have your your unrecorded discussion.